morning. Alan, you still have your class? I don't think if anybody I see Lizzie, and then you got two hoodlums up there. You can. Yeah, I'll just stay up there. I don't think there's anybody down there, but I'm going to go check. All right. Good morning. Morning. I think I'll be back. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here this morning. We got uh, kind of a smaller crowd, but I guess uh, some people are, are trying to stay in because of the virus, and, and maybe there are some that are quarantining as well. Uh, but uh, glad y'all were able to make it, and uh, uh, I'm really excited about uh, our discussion today uh, from Acts chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 12. Is there any updates to our bulletin that you'd like to uh, bring up and we can pray for them? I was wondering if anybody had an update on Dr. Christina. Uh, the last one I saw was that she um, was going to stay there in Houston. She, they initially went to the emergency room. But she, they gave her some steroids and uh, some other medications, I think. And now they're just staying in Houston until her next immunotherapy and treatment yeah so that was uh, I think that was yesterday so uh, she says she's not not feeling like herself and she's uh, her mobility has decreased quite a bit so um, so yeah let's continue to remember Roxanne in our prayers and that always gets me it always catches that thing I got a text from John McFall this morning asking him for prayers for himself and, and uh, for Christina. So let's just keep him in our prayers. Adam, my, my nephew Alex, he's huh? back to um, going to the bathroom and stuff like he was in the beginning. They had to take that plate out of his foot because it was, and they scraped it out and everything, but he's back to not being on his foot. Sounds like back to square one, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, he's kind of got a setback. Yeah. That was Alex Sanders, is that right? Alex, well, we just call him Alex. It was Alexander. Alexander, yeah. So Janie's uh, nephew, so keep remembering him in your yeah. prayers. Yeah, because he's, he's only 29. This is yeah. his eighth surgery. Wow. And he's had, you said eighth? Any more updates? Great. If not, let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, our Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you gave us a new day. And we can rejoice in that new day because you created it and that you have given us the privilege uh, this day of, of walking with you and uh, serving you and worshiping you and, and serving others. Uh, thank you, Lord, for that blessing. A new day. Help us as we come together today, uh, as we study your word, to um, have open hearts to it, and help us, Lord, to find ways that we can better obey uh, your will for our lives. Uh, we pray for our worship hour as well, that our worship will glorify you and honor you, and uh, we pray, Lord, uh, that if there's anyone here um, at church that, that needs to make changes, or maybe start following you for the first time, that you'll give them the courage to do that. We pray for the many that are sick. We know that a lot are going through um, uh, difficulties with the coronavirus. And uh, we just pray, Lord, uh, for your healing hand. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, the cases will start to, to fall off and, and the death toll will, will lessen and that, uh, that we as a nation um, and as a world can... Uh, put this behind us as soon as possible. Um, we pray, Lord, for those who are going through difficulties like Roxanne um, and Brad. Be with them, Lord, um, and give her uh, strength through uh, her next treatment. 
We pray, Lord, for John McFall and Christina and the difficulties that they face. Give them encouragement to, uh, to be who you want them to be and to, uh, to face the difficulties of their life uh, with faith. Uh, we pray for Alex uh, and his foot. We are so sad that he's uh, having to do uh, so much just to, to get back uh, to normal on his, on his feet. And we pray, Lord, that uh, the next, uh, whatever happens next, will help him to restore his, his health, his, his foot, and uh, to get back to normal as well. Uh, we know, Lord, there are many that are struggling with their health in our congregation, many that are uh, enduring loss. Um, we just pray you will bless them and help them during this time. Uh, thank you, Lord, so much for Jesus and the, the privilege through him to come and speak to you, our God, and uh, help us, Lord, through this day uh, to constantly depend on you and trust in you and to uh, live as you want us to. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Acts chapter 12. Uh, last week we kind of set this up. Uh, James, uh, the son of Zebedee, also the brother of John, uh, another one of the apostles, uh, was, was killed by Herod Agrippa I. Uh, there in the first verse, he laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, he saw that the Jews liked it, and so what he did in, in, uh, in that aftermath is to grab Peter and put him into jail, likely to kill him in order to please the Jews yet again. And so here we have a, a situation of a persecution against the church by Herod, by uh, the official um, the official governor of the land, and the church is having to deal with, with first of all, the loss of um, an apostle, so there's grief there, but also on the other side, uh, the concern that they have for Peter and his situation. And so in verse 5 it says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, that word earnest there is also used, uh, the Greek word is used back in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus prayed earnestly to God uh, to, to take the cup of wrath away from him if it was God's will. Uh, this is a, a prayer, as, as it says there in Luke, that made Jesus sweat like drops of blood. This was a an intense amount of prayer, uh, t intense quality of prayer that the church was making on behalf of, of Peter. They cared about Peter. Uh, they didn't want any bad to happen to him, and so they, they prayed earnestly for him. Can you remember a, lot, uh, a time in your life where you felt like the church, uh, because of, of something that's going on in the world or maybe something that the church was facing, um, that there was earnest prayer that was made by the church. Right. So, right, right. So, with Roxanne's diagnosis, that was one where the church pulled together and really prayed for her. Very good. Can you think of another time? Well, I imagine we did it for Tammy Sal a lot. Oh, yeah? So, I mean, I mean, there's, you know, like she went through that all for many years. Right. Yeah. So, I'm sure y'all remember many instances where people have come up to the hospital and prayed with, with Tammy. For sure. Any other times you can remember? <laughs> Seeking a new preacher. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, so the, there's a desire there by the church, um, you know, came together to, um, to seek God's will and who to, who to bring in. I, I think I can probably remember a, a lot of, you know, in the aftermath of 9-11, there was a lot of prayer that was prayed for the country and for uh, people to seek God. 
can remember that. I can think about, I mean, I think just with this virus, there's been a lot of prayer that has been offered um, for healing in that. Um, when we make these prayers with people who are ill, um, you know, situations with our country, it, is this something that we often do together, or is it something that often happens individually? It's both? Okay. I mean, yeah. My daily prayers are about life, I don't think. Right, right. And uh, we certainly don't need to discount the faithful prayer of one person. You know, um, one of the things I don't like about prayer requests is that it, sometimes I feel like people are asking because they don't feel like their own prayers work. So they got to ask everyone else. But, you know, it says the prayers of a righteous man, singular, availeth much. Uh, think about the, the persistent widow that Jesus tells us about in his parable. Where she bothered the, the judge all the time. And, and Jesus said that, that if we are, are persistent in our prayers and we don't lose heart, that God will hear our prayers and he will bring us justice. Um, With COVID, I think, uh, I don't know why God, I mean, and why it happened or nothing, but, mm -hmm. but I think that we will see light Oh yeah, yeah. It, um, it kind of reminds me of the sermon last week um, from the passage there of Paul's thorn in the flesh. He was told no, um, but it ended up being for the best of, of himself. You know, relying more on God and the best of uh, for other people to to in his weakness tell people about God's power. So uh, certainly God can work through his nose or through. Uh, very difficult times, um, you know. Here, here we find that, that James was not spared; he was killed. Uh, but we're going to see as we continue on that God was still working in that situation. But we've had people that have got through COVID a lot. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's been you know a lot of lives taken, but there's been a lot of people that have that have made it through. Right. Yeah. So there's that's something to be thankful for. I mean. Yeah. The vast majority do recover, and we're, we're certainly thankful for, for that uh, fact, for sure. I want to encourage us as a congregation uh, to do more of these prayers together. I know we have you know, designated times in our services to pray, um, but this was, you know, when they came together, and we'll see this in a little bit, it wasn't a, a service time, a, a worship service time. They came together because of that one issue and prayed. And um, I think that's a very important thing for us to do as a community, not just as an individual, not just send off the prayer requests on email and people do it individually in their homes. Those, that's good. But I think there's a lot more strength um, that we receive when we do that together. And um, I was reading a book uh, several years back uh, by F. Lagarde Smith. Some of you probably read some of his stuff. A member of the church that has written a lot of books. And uh, he was in England at one point doing some, uh, some work. And uh, he went to a church. Uh, it was not a church of Christ, uh, though there were a lot of similarities there. Um, he just couldn't find one in his area. And when he did, um, they decided... When they came together, they, they heard the news of a, a sister of theirs in the church uh, that she was um, dealing with cancer. And what the church proceeded to do, I think it was after their worship, uh, they proceeded to stay there for another three hours praying with each other. Um, and that, to me, that's just amazing, right? Um, but they saw the necessity of prayer, right? Uh, you wouldn't spend three hours in prayer if you didn't think it was important. Uh, but also just the, the need to be around each other, to deal with these, these difficulties, to grieve together, to, to cry out to God together. Um, I think we need to have more prayer sessions like that where we earnestly pray to God for certain situations and, and not just say, well, we'll pray on our own. Uh, there's strength in numbers. There's strength within the community. And um, I, think, I think we should, uh, we should follow this model that we see in the first century uh, even today. All right, let's keep going on. Verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, 
Peter was asleep between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the, the door or guarding the prison. So this is a lockdown prison. Very hard for him to get out. Verse 7, And behold, watch out, look out, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the, in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Uh, someone said this to me last week after we, we parted. I, maybe it was Stephen or, or someone, I don't remember who told me. He's like, isn't it funny that the angel struck him? You know, you think about wanting to be awoken from a sleep. He said, now Peter, wake up. Wake up. You know, something like to gently bring him into. No, he struck him. <laughs> wake up. Uh, and I think sometimes we acknowledge that there are times that we need to, to be struck too, to be woken up. We need something a little bit more forceful than something that's, that's gentle. Uh, but that's what happened here. And the chains fell off his hands. Verse 8. And the angel said, Dress yourself and put on your sandals and wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. <coughs> he did not know that, that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord and they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel left him verse 11 when Peter came to himself he said now I'm sure the Lord had sent his angels uh, sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod from all the Jewish people uh, from all that the Jewish people were expecting so he's led out of this prison cell as he's under extreme um, you know uh, surveillance having you know being chained to two guards beside him having some guards outside the prison there this is a lockdown situation but he is delivered from it but at first he doesn't think it's real he thinks it's a dream he thinks it's a, a vision not that this was actually happening but then finally when he gets out he's like Oh, I'm actually out. <laughs> this is real. Yeah, I guess he pinched himself or something. Uh, and he said that he was sure the Lord had sent his angel. <clears throat> sent his angel. Why was the angel sent? Why was the angel sent? To release Peter. Okay, release Peter. But but what was the what what caused God to send this this angel for him to release him? Say that again. Special guidance. Special guidance. Um, so, like a special relationship that Peter had with God, and yeah. okay. 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 So the prayer. Okay, and I, I think that's why it's put like back to back is an earnest prayer, and then he's released. Obviously, he cared about Peter, um, and but. Obviously, God cared about James, too, and he was killed. Um, you know, I don't know always how to work things out as far as, you know, uh, answered prayers, how that all always looks and, and feels and how we know um, God did it because of the prayers. I, sometimes it's, it's mystifying to us as human beings. But I think having it back-to-back, -back, verse 5, with this release, it's almost like, showing us, hey, your prayers actually work. And so when you are, are going through persecution, prayer is such an important part of the equation. I mean, I don't really know how long he was in prison, <laughs> but from Peter's viewpoint, at some point I'm sure he felt abandoned and lonely, and, <clears throat> and so it, it would have been, you know, wouldn't have been better if the angel came right away, so he didn't have to suffer at all, so he was released right away. But I think that's where we have
you know, and I think in our own lives, it's easy for us to think about in that moment, God, I'm going to my prayer right now. You know, mm-hmm. why, why did you wait so long? Right. Like, there's right. a bigger picture than just us involved. Yeah. I think God's working everything for the good of those right. <coughs> He's working all things good, but sometimes in the moment, it doesn't feel very good for us. Yeah, God could have spared him from going to prison in the first place, uh, but he didn't. He didn't choose that route. And like you said, it brought the church together, uh, it allowed them to depend on God, and then once, as we'll see in in the future, it it created more faith within the church because they were like, oh, God actually, or at least him, God actually answered our prayers, um, and it, it quite surprises them. We'll see that in just a second. Good thoughts. Very good. All right, verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. So we'll see him pop up a few times in the rest of Acts. John Mark, uh, it is believed he's the Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark, uh, but he's also the one that um, deserted Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, Where many were gathered together... And were praying, and he knocked at the door of the gateway. A servant named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing P- Peter's voice and her joy, she did not open the gate, <laughs> but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. I said, Are you are out of your mind? But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, It is his angel. Now, if it's his angel, okay, I still would want to go out and see, wouldn't you? But they. They didn't want to. Uh, Verse 16, But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. It was the Lord, right? And he said, Tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. No, Peter's in fact, this was the Lord who did this. He was the one who released me. And it, you, you can imagine what that would have done for the congregation at that time. They had been suffering persecution. They had lost an apostle. They were worried about Peter. And to see Peter, flesh and blood, right there in front of their eyes, to see that. And then on addition to that, for him to say, God, deliver me. God answered your prayers is uh, that had to build their faith up in the Lord. And uh, I think that's important for us when, um, when we are going through difficulties uh, to look at the good things that are coming from it, okay? I've thought about this a lot with COVID, right? It's, there's a lot of negative to this, this virus. Um, you know, it, obviously it's hurt uh, people's ability to come to worship. We had to be out for seven weeks and some... You know, because of um, what's going on uh, with their health, they can't come and, and be with us. Uh, I think about, you know, how this has canceled almost everything in our lives. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you, know, you know, people are even encouraging people not to, to go to Thanksgiving now because of this. I mean, there's just been a lot of things lost. And then there's the, the death on top of that, people losing their lives. It's just, it is, it is so disheartening uh, sometimes. But, what good has come from this situation? Has there been any good this past year? I know it's popular to put down 2020, right? But have there been good things that have happened? I think it put us in a situation to create a way for people to be able to join us for worship when they can. So it's open the doors for technology for the church uh, to get the message out to have more people. I've had childhood friends that watched our service. You know, I've been able to watch some of the guys I went to Green Harbor with who now preach, mm-hmm. and now I can go in and watch them preach in their. And that, that's so cool to be able to have that connection reestablished. Right. Right. 
So to, to get us to slow down a little bit, to focus more on our family, to focus more on our, our, our faith. Re-examine our priorities. Very good. I've heard saying families, families that eat together stay together. Mm -hmm. And I think it has brought people to the table. I mean, Mm -hmm. more than maybe just eating, maybe, um, like Destiny said, the closeness, I think, has lots of families just, they never sat down and eat a meal together. I think this has brought them to where they kind of think about stuff. I mean, I've had more maybe about the siblings or mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, whatever. Yeah, yeah so uh, bringing us closer together and, and even being thoughtful of, of other people, uh, I think that's definitely a, a pro from all of this. Any other things? Absolutely. I, I think you're right. There's a lot of people on the other side that are, are, uh, are looking for the gospel now. And then it encourages us to, to say, hey, what's really important about life? Little, we're starting to get a little more open to some answers. You know, I think you're right. This world can go just like that. Right. Right. Uh, let's pray that last um, and uh, that, that we can somehow reach out to people. We've had... You know, uh, this year we've had, you know, several baptisms, even through all of this stuff. And uh, I know I've had probably, um, probably as many Bible studies as I've had in a while. Um, and so there, there's opportunities for that. Um, so definitely some things to thank God for. Yeah, it's better to be in a house of mourning than a house of, um, like, party or festival or whatever, uh, gladness, or I can't remember exactly what it is. I think it might be Ecclesiastes, but, yeah, so it, you know, and Jesus said himself, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There's a blessing that comes along with mourning. Uh, we usually don't think about that at the moment, but, uh, it, what, what was it? Yeah, yeah. Wow, this is the end of, of all man. Ecclesiastes 2, 7, 2 for those who are at home. Um, so yeah, certainly uh, when we are considering mourning um, and, and death, it brings us closer to God and say, am I right with God? Am I doing what he has asked me to do? Am I, if something were to happen to me, would I be okay? And uh, certainly... Uh, what we all always need to be thinking about, but uh, occasions like this maybe help us think about it more. Any more thoughts? One thing I've loved about it, and this is weird, I'm saying this, but like when live sports was canceled in March, I canceled my TV subscription, and I am so glad I did. I have read more books. Uh, I probably have read now twice as many books as I read last year. And it, a lot of it was just, you know, if something's on TV, I'll watch it, you know, and it's, uh, most of that's not edifying or, or uh, help me to grow as a person, individual, as a husband, and father, and a Christian. So uh, I've definitely been thankful for, for that, for sure. Uh, sometimes things uh, disrupt our lives, and uh, we, I think we see this here, the, the killing of James and the persecution of the church, it was a disruption to their life, but there was still good that came from it. They were able to come together, to grow together, to pray together, 
and to see God answer their prayers with uh, with saving um, with saving Peter here. Uh, verse 18. Now, when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. In other words, they were they were mystified, and they uh, they certainly um, were arguing with each other about what was going on. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered them that they should be put to death. It made him look bad, right? Then he went down to Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon because they came to him with one accord. And having a uh, persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's food, a uh, king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a god and not of man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last breath. That sounds great, right? So here we have Herod, the uh, antithesis of of, of the church here, the, um, the arch enemy of the church, uh, having pride in his heart that God struck him down. And when I was reading this, I couldn't help to think of, of uh, Romans chapter 12, where God said, or Peter, uh, Paul says uh, that, um, that we aren't to take revenge, we aren't to take things into our own hands, but the Lord has said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. God will take care of our enemies. Um, he doesn't call the church to take care of our enemies. He's going to take care of our enemies. Uh, we just keep doing what we're supposed to be doing. We keep praying. We keep being diligent. We keep spreading the word. And what's interesting here is what the, the report that happens in verse 24. It says, And the word of God increased and multiplied. How in the world can the, can, can the church increase during persecution? Well, it was because they were more faithful to God and spreading the word and praying to God. And um, even in difficulty, uh, God found a way for his word to, to go on. And I think we need to remember that too. When we face difficulties and trials and, yes, even persecution, come together, be who we need to be, be united as the church, allow God to take care of the rest. And when that happens... Uh, the word of God can increase and multiply. And I pray that that's, that's what's happening right now uh, during this, this pandemic, that we as a church can come together, unite together, pray together, and increase the word through our, our actions, our words, um, and that God's word will be multiplied here in our community and throughout the world. Any more thoughts before we move on to the next uh, part of Acts? All right, if not, we'll keep going. Uh, Acts chapter 13, uh, the first three chapters is, is Paul and Barnabas being set apart uh, for their missionary journey, their first missionary journey together. Now, Paul had had other missionary journeys before this, 14 years in Arabia, actually. Uh, but here, this is where uh, Paul and Barnabas come together, and uh, they start working with each other. All right, so... Uh, they sent them off, verse 3, and they first went to a place called Cyprus, verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, which is an island in the Mediterranean. Verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, which is a town there in Cyprus, they proclaimed the word of, of the Lord in the synagogue of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. This is John Mark that we read about just a little bit ago. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Paul, excuse me, Barnabas and Saul. And sought to hear the word of God. Wow, that's pretty amazing, right? You have this pro-council, um, this leader of, um, of, of Cyprus, inviting him to tell the word. 
What a great opportunity, right? And it says, but, uh, I don't even know how to say it. It's Alamus, I guess that's how you say it. Um, this is talking about Bar-Jesus again. The magician, for that is what the meaning of his name was, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So here, as an opportunity, and immediately an opportunity is met with opposition by this magician. Verse 9, But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. He said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see uh, the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. All right, this is kind of an interesting situation, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing your take on all of this, because they're here in Cyprus. And they're, they're about to have this awesome opportunity to speak to the pro-council, Sergius Paulus. But then they have this magician here that's opposing them. And here, Paul says kind of a mean thing. It seems very mean to me. I, I, maybe it's just my uh, sensibilities. But if you call someone a son of the devil, don't you kind of feel that's a little mean? <laughs> call it like it is? <laughs> Well, that's true, but my mom always said, if you can't say something nice, I'll say anything at all. Uh, let, let me kind of give you a, a little bit of background. It, he still says some pretty tough things here, right? Enemy of righteousness. Uh, you know, he, he almost, you know, he predicts right on the spot that God was going to strike him, and God did. But the name Bar Jesus, the word Bar in Hebrew, means son. So, here this guy's name was son of Jesus, and Paul says instead, no, you're a son of the devil. Okay? Now the word devil is the word slanderer. Okay? That's what it, it means in the, the Greek, slanderer. So this guy was slandering the truth, and he says, that's, that's who you are. That's who you are. You are. Your characteristic is that of a slanderer. Okay? So maybe that lessens the blow a little bit to see he's kind of doing a play on words. You know, you say your name is Bar Jesus, it's really Bar Devil. Okay? Um, but also here it says that, uh, that Paul. By the way, this is where we see the name change of Saul and Paul. He's known as Saul all the way up to this point, and then it switches to Paul. Um, in the Roman culture, they often have three different names. Uh, one was like a given name by your parents. But there's also kind of like a Roman name, and then on top of that, kind of a family name. Uh, most of us have three names, right? A first name, middle name, last name. Um, one we go by, one that... Only our mom knows, right? Whenever I get in trouble, well, Christopher Adam Bowles, you know. Um, she didn't sound like that or anything. I already got in trouble with the thing the other night, so I'm, I'm going to get on her good side. Um, so, so anyway, um, you know, we're called by different things by different people. Like Carl right here, everyone knows him as Carl, right? But then if you talk to his family, it's Junior, right? So we all kind of have different names or maybe nicknames in certain situations. Well, that was what it was with Paul. Paul was his uh, Roman name, and it makes sense as he begins his missionary, uh, missionary journeys to the Gentiles that he would be, be going by that name. And then on top of that, you have uh, Saul, which is his Hebrew name. Um, he came from the tribe of Benjamin. And who, who was the prominent person who came through the tribe of Benjamin in the Bible? Do you remember? Who's the famous Benjaminite in the Old Testament? Who's the first king of Israel? Saul, right. 
So he was, in, he was probably named after King Saul. Uh, I'm not sure if I would want to be named after King Saul, but <laughs> he had some good features there at first. But uh, anyway, so here uh, we have kind of explaining, um, you know, kind of explaining the change of names. All right. So here we have Saul, also named Paul, verse 9, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice what he was saying was based upon guidance by the Holy Spirit. Okay, So we can't say what he's saying is wrong. We can't say, well, Paul, you're kind of being a little too mean there. It's, it's really the Spirit that was speaking through him. Did Jesus ever call people uh, names that weren't too pleasant? Yes, okay. What names were they? Well, Brood of Vipers comes to mind. Yes, Brood of Vipers. That's the classic one, right? Uh, ugh, snakes. Uh, I can't stand to even think about them. Um, obviously, that would be a bad one. Any other ones that y'all can remember? One main one. Hypocrites, right? Uh, if someone calls you a hypocrite you're probably not going to be too happy about that. Uh, we also see there's a, a time that he called them whitewashed tombs. Uh, they looked all great and white on the outside, but you open it up and there's dead bones. Um, so there, there were certainly some words that both Jesus and even John the Baptist said that were a little striking. But I think a lot of times that is, um, uh, a lot of them are in the context of there's someone preventing others from, from hearing the word of God. Okay, That's usually the context I see uh, the strong language in. We even see this in, in Paul's writing too. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, he calls uh, the false teachers dogs and mutilators of the flesh. Okay, um, He says, beware of the dogs. Um, he calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. Um, Second uh, Corinthians, messengers of Satan. Um, there are certainly words that are, are very strong, but they're usually reserved for those who are trying to oppose someone or, or lead someone astray from the Lord one way or another. And, and that's the context we find ourselves in right here. Because here, uh, Bar-Jesus, uh, Elamus, uh, or Limus, he is trying to prevent pro-counsel, Sergius Paulus, from being able to hear the word of God. And so based upon that, he said those strong words, God was the one who struck him with blindness. Now look at verse 12. This, is, I think, is, is significant. It says, Then the pro-counsel believed when he saw what had excuse me, occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Okay, so here, we don't get the end of what happened to Sergius Paulus if he became a, a Christian or, or what. We don't get that. But he at least believed. He at least believed. And he believed based upon what? Okay, so what he saw, he saw the blindness happen. But was, was it just what he saw? Okay, so there's teaching involved. Notice that, or, or think about this, the magician that was next to him probably showed him a lot of fantastic things throughout the years, right? Um, I mean, you can watch some of the, the stuff on TV um, with the magicians, and you're just kind of amazed. You know, how do they do that? And you, you know they have to do it uh, through some type of sleight of hand or, or something like this. Now, there is one guy, David Blaine, or is it David or Daniel? I think it's David Blaine. I kind of think he sold his soul to the devil because he's done, doing some things that I was like, that is no way that could happen outside of like that black magic. Um, but I'm sure that Bar Jesus gave, um, that he gave uh, a lot of things to look at that were fantastic. But here it was. It was here a miracle alongside the word. That it was the word that had astonished him. Isn't that interesting there? 
says that the word astonished him. How does the word of God astonish together the fulfillment of prophecy I'm sure that he he referenced the Old Testament and and showed him how it was all fulfilled in Jesus so yeah that's good what else uh oh someone got a deer I was wondering why it was kind of a light crowd this morning now I'm like oh okay I know what it is <laughs> Jeremy's smiling pretty big back there, so I'm sure it's a big one, right? Eight point? Wow. All right. How does the Word of God astonish us? How does the teaching of Jesus astonish us? Is the Bible just something you read and you're like, eh, it's okay? wisdom from God, the wisdom that is so practical in our lives. What else? So there's an element where the teachings of Jesus have an impact on the audience that, like you said, Jesus taught as one who had authority. Um, they, he was revealing things that there's just no way for that to be from a human, a human teacher. You know, there's a lot of people who have been great teachers throughout time. But there's no one that's been like Jesus when it comes to being. I think one of the biggest things that should astonish us in the scriptures uh, in the teachings of Jesus is just the fact that, that God loves us so much that he sent his own son to die for us. Um, that it really is true that the God cares about me individually and that he wants to save me from my sins and to have a relationship with me day by day and, and then for eternity. That should astonish us. And so here, yes, the, the miracle certainly confirmed the word. We see in the first chapter of Hebrews, that was the purpose in the first century of the miracles. But on its own, the teaching of Jesus is astonishing. And that's why I think it's so important that we are, are reading the Bible day by day to be again astonished by God's word. But also, when we're teaching other people, don't discount just simply reading the Bible. I know we want to have these arguments of words, and it goes back and forth sometimes. But sometimes the, the best way is just to open up the Word. So let's see what God says, and read it together, and see what the Word is bringing forth for us. There is power in the Word. In fact, Paul says in Romans 1, 16, it's the power of salvation to everyone who believes. It's the message that has the power to change the lives of people. And we don't need to discount that. That is so important for us to realize as we're studying with people, as we're teaching, is that we need to hear the word of God and to be astonished again by it. And I think others will be astonished by it as well if we show them and teach them that word. Uh, thank you all for your participation. I hope, uh, I hope you got something out of this lesson. And uh, we will look forward to worshiping with you in just a little bit.